Chapter 10 My dear Wormwood, I was delighted to hear from Tritwees that your patient has made some very desirable new acquaintances, and that you seem to have used this event in a really promising manner. I gather that the middle-aged married couple who called at his office are just the sort of people we want him to know. Rich, smart, superficially intellectual, and brightly skeptical about everything in the world. I gather they are even vaguely pacifist, not on moral grounds, but from an ingrained habit of belittling anything that concerns the great mass of their fellow men, and from a dash of purely fashionable and literary communism. This is excellent. And you seem to have made good use of all his social, sexual, and intellectual vanity. Tell me more. Did he commit himself deeply? Uh, I don't mean in words. There is a subtle play of looks and tones and laughs by which a mortal can imply that he is of the same party of those to whom he is speaking. That is the kind of betrayal you should specially encourage, because the man does not fully realize it himself, and by the time he does, you will have made withdrawal difficult. No doubt he must very soon realize that his own faith is in direct opposition to the assumptions on which all the conversation of his new friends is based. I don't think that matters much, provided that you can persuade him to postpone any open acknowledgement of the fact, and this with aid of shame, pride, modesty, and vanity, will be easy to do. As long as the postponement lasts, he will be in a false position. He will be silent when he ought to speak, and laugh when he ought to be silent. He will assume, at first only in his manner, but presently by his words, all sorts of cynical and skeptical attitudes, which are not really his. But if you play him well, they may become his. All mortals tend to turn into the thing they are pretending to be. <laughs> this is elementary. The real question is how to prepare for the enemy's counter-attack. The first thing is to delay as long as possible the moment at which he realizes this new pleasure is a temptation. Since the enemy's servants have been preaching about the world as one of the great standard temptations for 2,000 years, this might seem difficult to do, but fortunately, they have said very little about it for the last few decades. In modern Christian writings, though I see much, indeed more than I like, about mammon, I see few of the old warnings about worldly vanities, the choice of friends, and the value of time. All that your patient would probably classify as Puritanism. And may I remark in passing that the value we have given to that word is one of the really solid triumphs of the last hundred years. By it, we rescue annually thousands of humans from temperance, chastity, and sobriety of life. Sooner or later, however, the real nature of his new friends must become clear to him, and then your tactics must depend on the patient's intelligence. If he is a big enough fool, you can get him to realize the character of the friends only when they are absent. Their presence can be made to sweep away all criticism. If this succeeds, he can be induced to live, as I have known many humans live for quite long periods, two parallel lives. He will not only appear to be, but actually be, a different man in each of the circles that he frequents. Failing this, there is a subtler and more <laughs> entertaining method. 
he can be made to take a positive pleasure in the perception that the two sides of his life are inconsistent. This is done by exploiting his vanity. He can be taught to enjoy kneeling beside the grocer on Sunday just because he remembers that the grocer could not possibly understand the urbane and mocking world which he inhabited on Saturday evening, and, contrarywise, to enjoy the body and blasphemy over the coffee with these admirable friends all the more because he is aware of a deeper spiritual world within him which they cannot understand. And you see the idea. The worldly friends touch him on one side and the grocer on the other, and he is complete, balanced, a complex man who sees round them all. Thus, while being permanently treacherous to at least two sets of people, he will feel, instead of shame, a continual undercurrent of self-satisfaction. Finally, if all else fails, you can persuade him, in defiance of conscience, to continue the new acquaintance on the grounds that he is, in some unspecified way, doing these people good by the mere fact of drinking their cocktails and laughing at their jokes, and that to cease doing so would be priggish or intolerant and, of course, puritanical. Meanwhile, you will, of course, take the obvious precaution of seeing that this new development induces him to spend more than he can afford and to neglect his work and his mother. Her jealousy and alarm and his increasing evasiveness or rudeness will be invaluable for the aggravation of the domestic tension. Your affectionate uncle. Screw tape.